Okay, here we go. Okay, there you go. So you're all very welcome this afternoon to this Explore series peer review session. I'm Sandra Hines. I work for Aberdeen University Press, and I'm delighted to be joined today by um, Professor Morella Della Begovic uh, from the Institute of Medical Sciences and also Professor Michael Brown, who's from the Research Institute for Irish and Scottish Studies. So I'll start off, I'll just give a very brief introduction to peer review, and then I'll let Morella come in. She'll be talking about the uh, the grant research grants and how peer review links into that. And Michael will start talking about, uh, later on, he'll talk about uh, the arts humanities and peer review publications. I think Morella will also deal with STEM publications and peer review. Uh, and then after that, there'll be a chance to ask questions. You can either ask questions in the chat or you can put your hand up. So I'll start off now. What do we mean by peer review? Well, peer review is the evaluation of research by other researchers in a scholarly field. It assesses the validity, significance and originality of the work, and it gives feedback to the author. It's used by journal editors and publishers such as Aberdeen University Press, and it's also used by research councils and funding bodies when they consider grant proposals. So peer review is taken into account by policymakers and reporters and the general public when weighing up the value of research findings. Why is peer review, um, why peer review as a researcher? Well, it gives researchers insight into the latest developments in the research area, and it also contributes to the research community. Peer review develops critical thinking as well as writing and data presentation skills, and it provides a diversity of views and shares knowledge. And in many cases, it supports open research. So single blind peer review. This is sometimes known as single anonymous peer review. And in single blind peer review, only the reviewers are anonymous. Reviewers know the author's names and affiliations, but authors don't know those of the reviewers. And this is commonly used for book proposals because the track record of the researcher or the researchers is, is relevant to the viability of the project. Double blind peer review. That's where both the authors and the reviewers keep their anonymity. Only the editor knows the identity of all the parties involved. And this is currently the standard model used by journals when considering submitted articles. But you have to make sure that you anonymize your submission in this. So you'd need to make sure you don't have your name in the uh, file name or uh, to make sure that in, under properties, you don't have your name listed there. And open peer review. And this, this is a general term used to describe any peer review model in which aspects of the peer review process are made publicly available either before or after publication. It's where the authors know the identity of their reviewers and vice versa. So the reviewers names and or the reports are included alongside the published paper. So it's completely open and open peer review is increasingly popular with open access publications. So with that, I'll hand you over to Morella, who and she's going to talk about um, the research grant life cycle and peer review. Thanks, Sandra. And, I, and I'll just say in, in STEM, so I'll maybe just introduce myself. So I'm, I'm a professor in the Institute of Medical Sciences. I have been within the University of Aberdeen for 16 and a half years. Um, and I just wanted to kind of comment that most of the things I'll be talking about is my perspective of what happens in STEM. And in STEM, it's really still very much single um, blind review as well as maybe open review, but the double blind is very rare to be honest but I think it's a really good idea to move forward but what I'll be telling you today about is really what happens to your grant once you submit your grant OK, and then how you deal with the reviewers responses. So this is kind of a, a typical life cycle of a grant. You have an idea, you're preparing it yourself, then you start developing that, that idea. You may be pitching it to your colleagues to get a bit of feedback before you develop it fully, and then you, you work on it before you submit it. And what you want to think about when you're when you're submitting your grant or before you submit your grant is, is really all these questions here. What does what is this grant about? Who are you writing it for and who are you wanting to address? Why do you need to do this? What is the problem that you're trying to address? And then how are you going to do it? So you need to explain the process through which you're going to be going through. And then when? When is also the important one? Is this the right time to be doing this 
um, grant, whatever research proposal you, you're developing, is this the most timely opportunity to pri provide it with? And then you have to provide your reviewers with the reasons behind that. And where? I mean, obviously, you know, what is the what is the place that you're doing it? In? What is the environment? So all these things need to be in your grant in order to, to have any chances of success. And I'm sure most of you will know it and you'll ask questions about it later. But within STEM, area really the one of the most important things apart for all these things that are here is the PPI so public patient involvement and engagement so it's actually PPIE and people quite often think about it kind of afterwards after they develop the grant they start thinking about oh how am I going to communicate with the public and how am I going to communicate with the patients that I, I'm wanting to target let's say I work on diabetes so when am I going to speak to my patients living with diabetes but actually you should be thinking about this process at every single point in your grant cycle so when you're thinking of an idea like I want to work on diabetes and people who have you know diabetic retinopathy. Do people have a problem with this? So this is when you start engaging from from very beginning and actually the most likely um, outcome that you're going to be successful is if you're involving these individuals from the beginning. So from the idea preparation all the way to, to the outcome. And um, if we can move on to the next one, Sandra, please. I will come back to the PPI and why it's important. But for example, when, when I get a grant to review, I, I as a reviewer have to comment on several things. And before I talk about what we have to consider, I should also say I started reviewing grants and papers um, when I started my first postdoc. So straight out of my PhD, when my postdoc mentor was asked to review papers and review grants. He approached me asking if I would be willing to do it with him. Uh, I um, accepted that. It's hard work, but that's the best way to learn how to actually approach peer review and how to respond to peer review. Um, so what I have to comment on as a reviewer is, um, is there a clear statement of the research um, aims? So what is it that you want to do? How well have you articulated what you're after? What is your research question and what are your research objectives? And remember the research aims and research objectives are quite different things. So then as a reviewer, as well as a panel member for, for different funding bodies, I'm asked to highlight the strengths and the weaknesses of the proposal. Um, Parts of the strengths and the weaknesses of the proposal is whether the applicant has presented really the research that is state of the art in its field. So are you using state of the art um, technology? Are you using state of the art techniques? Is what you're proposing something that hasn't been done before? Or if it has been done before, what is it that is novel about your proposal that is going to really move the field forward rather than make it incremental? And of course, has all the relevant literature been reviewed? Because remember, when it goes out to the reviewers, nine out of ten is going to go to the expert who has published on this. And if you haven't cited their work, especially if it's kind of contradictory to what you're proposing, they'll be very upset. So it's much better, even if it's against your argument, to say so and so have published this, but actually our preliminary data suggests that this may be different or that we can take it beyond this. So remember that. And then of course, you know, the state of the art kind of links into the methodology. So is the method likely to yield valid, valid, reliable and trustworthy data, i.e. is the method robust enough to actually answer your question? So many people in, in their grant applications were proposed to do X, Y and Z, but actually they're not using technology or methods that will give them the answer. And then reviewers really pick up on that very quickly. So if the answer to the second question is yes, then what is the impact uh, of financing the study? So on patient care from STEM perspective is how are we going to improve healthcare? How are we going to improve uh, professional practice? How is it going to impact the society? So always have that impact in mind. Many funding bodies have now removed that impact statement. There used to be two or three pages with pe which people found quite annoying that you have to think about it. But actually what's expected is now is that impact will be thread throughout your grant proposal. Who are you aiming to to deliver this research towards and how is this going to help them so sixth uh, I have seven points to make so six point is that is there sufficient confidence that the research team will deliver the study on time with expected quality outputs and budgets so 
what is the research team like? If it's a fellowship, obviously it's you, but then you have to surround yourself with the right collaborators that will allow you to, to, to deliver your research. And that's what reviewers are looking for. Are you in the right place to do this work? Is the environment around you okay? And also, who is going to help you deliver on this work? So it's the whole team and not just yourself. And then, of course, can you do it in the time? So are you too ambitious? Are you not ambitious enough for three years or five years? And can you actually deliver it for that money? There's no point promising that you're going to find a new cure for um, you know, prostate cancer if you're actually asking for £200,000 and three years budget. It's not going to happen. So you've got to be realistic about that. And then, of course, does the study provide value for money? And this value for money is really important because people often think that if they just ask for less money, they'll be much more likely to be successful. But that's not the case. When when we look as reviewers and as panel members as something being value for money is really what you're proposing to do, you know, can you do it for that amount of money? Are you asking for too much or are you asking for too little? And this is where actually advice from colleagues and mentors and peer reviewers within the university helps you develop that. So if we can move on to the next, please. Um, so as I said in STEM, the, one of the really important things is that kind of development of the PPI. And as I say, it should be done from the beginning when you're thinking about your idea. It's like, is this a problem? Is this a problem for a person living with whatever disease you're trying to target? Because if it isn't, it's not a worthwhile question to ask unless you're doing blue skies research, which is very different. And why this is really important. So for example, I'll just use an example of one of the panels um, I sat on for six years was Diabetes UK. PPI reviewers, there was a whole panel of them, they would look at your lay summary as well as how this research is going to impact the outcomes. And they would score you and the, the level of the score had the same weighting as the scientific reviewers. So that shows you how important it is to have that communication open at all times to say, have I written this lay summary well enough? Just because I put inverted commas, it doesn't make it any more co uh, lay, right? So, and when we talk about patient and public involvement, this is not about you doing the research and then organizing a school event or, you know, event in the evening to tell people what you found. That is public engage, public outreach. PPI is different to public outreach in that, that you're actually involving people living with the condition throughout or those who are taking care of those individuals. Okay, next please. So, You've submitted your grant. Phew, excellent. You don't hear three, four, five, six months, and then you get those reviews. Okay. So your response to reviewers is as important as your grant submission. I was given advice when I first started here that I should spend a minimum of three months on a grant and probably more likely over six to nine months if it's a new investigator award or a career development award. You really need to have it tight, and there's no point submitting it unless it's ready. But once you submit it, you know, that's not it. You get the reviews back and this is as important as your submission. So you get those reviews, you read it, and I would say first you have to digest it and you're going to go through the five stages of, of grant refusal, which is, you know, you feel really demotivated, you feel very sad, then you feel really angry, and then you feel that the reviewer doesn't know what they're talking about. But once you've gone through the five stages of grief, as we call it, then sit back and then look at the points. What are the points the reviewer is trying to make? Okay. And very often, nine out of 10, again, you'll find that there are commonalities in the in the reviewers uh, responses. So for example, they'll say it was difficult to assess feasibility of the study due to complete lack of power analysis. So did you have an a right number of replicates in your biological samples? How, did you have a right number of people, mice, etc.? OK, so proposal is too ambitious for what it's trying to do. Uh, it's more like a program grant rather than a three year project grant. Or applicants are trying to do XXS, but actually they're not going to do it with YYY technology. Right? So you sit back, you digest it, you read through it, and then you use the highlighter pen to see what are the commonalities? What do I really need to answer 110%? Because you have to think about it. When you're writing your response to reviewers, it does not go back to those reviewers. They will never see your response. Okay? Who is going to see your response is the panel members. So the panel members will look at it and go, okay, 
have you answered the questions that the reviewers had, you know, legitimate points or not legitimate, but you still have to address those. So where possible, of course, you want to add the preliminary data. If you can't add preliminary data because you don't have the sources, you don't have any money, you don't have the technology there, then you have to look around and see if there are any people who can collaborate with you who could maybe provide you with data and you could acknowledge them in the grant. Um, to find new collaborators, get letters of support from them, you can put their name in institution brackets. Um, and as I say, group similar concerns together. So you can say here's a point by point, um, you know, um, rebuttal to, to reviewers. But since reviewers one, two and three raise the same concern, I've got the same response. So then this is where you will calmly explain why they may not be right, but in a in a most professional way and actually persuade them by using arguments. So cite literature or cite preliminary data if you've got. And then before you send this back, remember when you were submitting a grant, you got lots of peer review from your colleagues, from your friends. Do the same for your rebuttal letter because this is really important to get that funding. So send it to your mentor, send it to peer reviewers, send it to research and innovation to comment whether you have addressed the questions, how you may be able to improve it. Sometimes it's just about the language that you've used. Try not to be aggressive. Obviously, you, you, you appreciate constructive comments by the reviewers. And then, as I say, send it back thanking them, of course, <laughs> but in your mind, you can be thinking whatever you want. OK, so if we moved on to the next one. So once you've you've done that rebuttal letter, it comes to me as a panel member. So, for example, a, I sit on the MRC panel and for each MRC grant, there are three of us who will be speaking for each grant. So as a panel member, what I'm what I have to provide is comments on, you know, how well you've rebutted your um, whatever the reviewers have uh, raised the concerns, then I have to comment whether I disagree with the reviewers, whether, you know, especially if reviewers have different views, it will happen that, you know, somebody will give it uh, uh, to a score one to six with six as maximum. Somebody might give it a six, somebody might give it a two. I have to provide my opinion who's right and who I agree with. Um, but really, the worst re uh, reviewer that you'll get is the one that's called the kiss of death score. So if his score is one to six and if they give you a four, this is the kiss of death. OK, so you really want to make sure to show for those reviewers how innovative you are, because they can say this is good science, but it's incremental and it's not moving field forward. You have to be really persuasive with those for the panel member. Next, please. So this is where your applicants response to reviewers concerns comes in really um, into effect. I have to comment whether you've addressed everything. Uh, and as I say, um, you know, particularly the ones if 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 a same issue has been highlighted by more than one reviewer, that's what I'm, I'm interested in, in looking at how well you've rebutted it to give me the confidence that you can deliver that science. Next, please. And then as a panel member, I have to comment on three P's as well, which is the person, place and project. So this is why it's really important in your application and in your rebuttal to reiterate why this is so important and timely, why you're the person to do it, why the project is important, obviously, and why this is the right place to do it with the right collaborative network. OK. So I'll fi finish with my final slide, which is now you've done all this research. Of course, you want to publish it. So now you're going to be responding to reviewers. So you're going to do your um, submission, whether it's going to be a general review or it's going to be, um, you know, um, your original article. So again, when you submit your uh, paper, you will get the comments from the reviewers and they will be as nasty <laughs> as the ones that you get for the reviews. So digest it, OK? Don't respond with a knee jerk reaction. Have a look at, you know, again, what are the commonalities? What is it that they've all raised that is obviously lacking in your study? So plan the additional experiments where you can. Draft a response to, you know, to your rebuttal letter and use the literature wherever you can to support your um, um, statements. Spend time on this rebuttal and in particular spend time on all your graphs and data figures because 80% of all rejections are done as a desk rejection if the data don't look pretty enough. So spend time making graphs that are 
perfect and write a really good rebuttal letter. So you have to do point by point responses. Um, there's nothing more frustrating as a reviewer because these do go back to the reviewers. There's nothing more frustrating if I've raised five points. I've obviously spent time doing it and then you don't even acknowledge that I asked you. That's going to result in a rejection. So even if, if it's a minor point, say we agree we couldn't do this, but we've now added on extra um, two paragraphs in the discussion to address those concerns. OK, you get that one chance to to get a, a good response. So do it well. And the main thing is really to keep cool. So stay calm and deliver the message. OK, and I think with that I might be finished and I'll be handing on to Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morella. I'll pass on to Michael now and he can introduce himself and take us through the peer review process for publications. OK, thanks, Sandra. I'm going to build quite a bit on what Morella was saying, although it should be noted that there are some significant differences between both the ways in which the STEM uh, publications work and, the, and those that are working in humanities, arts and social sciences. Perhaps the quickest of these is that humanities, arts and social sciences tends to take time. Uh, there's very, very slow processes quite often of publication, so you do need to be patient. And often it's uh, the case that it's single author rather than the group author that matters. And so part of the discussion then is how you use your own network of mentors and friendships to build a kind of a commentary team on, on your work that you do. It's not built into the project. But if you have got to the point of submitting an article to a publication, um, I think one of the crucial things that we need to, you need to understand is the process by which a, a journal or indeed a, pu a publisher, if it's a, a big monograph study, um, how they, they operate through the system. So what I'm going to begin by talking about is the peer review process for publications. The very first thing, what Rella pointed out, is you can get a desk rejection. That means the editor of a journal or the editor of a uh, publishing house has decided that this isn't the appropriate venue for this article to take forward. Um, so what you'll find is, is that you'll very quickly be told this isn't relevant to our scope. It isn't uh, something that we wish to pick up at this point, or it may just be that they've done a quick sense check of the article and decided that it isn't uh, of the caliber that they think is relevant for their journal. And that leads immediately, as you can see here, to a rejection. That doesn't mean that the article can't be published. It means it just isn't going to be published at the first place of choosing. Um, so you quite often will move on and try and submit to subsequent journals. Every academic has uh, a long list of journals in their uh, files. That's just the nature of the process. So it's not to be taken personally. It's not to be downhearted about it. Part of the process is trying to identify places that like the kind of work that you do and to try and work your way into a system whereby you find venues that are comfortable with the kind of work that you're doing. So if they do accept it on the desk, uh, they will send it to usually two uh, experts. Now, this can lead to two different to three different decisions indeed. Um, on the result on the back of that, either a rejection, which is then justified in the peer review that you usually will receive, or you'll get what is uh, most common, a revise and resubmit, which means that they like the premise of the piece that you're doing. They like some of the basic uh, empirical work that's been done, the research that sits behind the project, but they see significant things that need to be done either by way of presentation or additional to the uh, literature additional work that you need to do to make the uh, article uh, publishable. And they will lay out, if the review is a good one, precisely what's involved in that resubmission. And that then will lead, hopefully, to the third of those decisions, which is invariably what I describe as accept with revisions. Because no reviewer likes to think that they've read an article or indeed a long book and have nothing constructive to say, nothing to add, no insight that they could offer. And so what you rarely will get is uh, acceptance without changes. What you'll find is that there'll be minor amendments and changes that are suggested, if only to show that the reviewer has actually read the work and that they haven't just given put it through on the nod. So that acceptance with revisions will lead, particularly in some of the more major journals, to a final review stage by an editorial board member. You'll see at the front of journals a long list of editorial board memberships. Now, they may or may not be actively involved in the process, but at the very top end of the journals, they certainly are. And what they're doing is they are reviewing the work to see whether or not if it would be relevant to the journal and to the readership of that journal more widely. You may well have written one of the finest works about Voltaire's philosophy, a uh, very intricate, very detailed piece of study, but that may have been of little or no interest 
to those outside of those uh, the scholarship concerned with Voltaire. And so what you need to do is to try and find um, at the, what the editorial board does is provide a sense check for that. That then hopefully will lead to it being accepted and published. Uh, we move on to the next slide, thanks. The next phase is to think about what's being asked of a reviewer during that process. When, the art, when your article is sent out to a, a reviewer, what is it that they're actually being asked to a judge? As I pointed out, the fundamental question at heart is, should the journal or the press publish this particular study? And that can be a yes without revisions, a yes but with revisions, or reject but for these kinds of reasons. There's a rationale behind the decisions that the reviewer is being asked to make. But a little bit like Morella was saying about the funding, if, the, if you're putting in a funding application, the question that really lies behind all of the other decisions is whether or not the grant is value for money. And what's being asked of a journal uh, reviewer or a book reviewer is should a reader really be spending their time reading this piece of work? There's an awful lot of material out there. We all have, you know, my shelves are full of books that I've read only some of. And I have to decide each time whether I'm going to spend my next week, 10 days, month, reading this book over another book. Similarly with articles, there's a vast slew of articles that come out and a decision has to be taken whether or not a reader should be encouraged to spend their time reading this particular article over and against other things that they might be spending their time doing. And that's the decision that the reviewer is really being asked. Uh, next slide. So how does the reviewer decide that? Well, there are a series of things that the reviewer might be trying to consider. In the introduction, they're looking at whether or not the work is fundamentally original. Does this provide a gap in the literature? So this is your job in a sense in the article is to lay out very quickly what gap it is you're trying to address. You then try and suggest that there's a gap in the literature because you have already mastered that literature area. And the reviewer is being asked in turn, is the research base that is being offered, being summarized in the literature comprehensive in kind? Or is there obvious things that are being missed? Have they noticed the most recent publication in the area? Have they noticed the standard work in the area? That then leads to the questions around methodology. Is the approach that the author is taking seriously credible? Are they doing the right kind of work to answer the question they pose themselves? So does it do its job and is the method being used properly? Finally, they're being asked if the conclusion, the further findings are fundamentally convincing. Is the ar argument going to convince the reader once they've read it through? And more generally, does the article actually read well? Have you been carried from the proposing of a question to the answering of the question succinctly and with a degree of convincement? Are you able to move the author? Has the, has the reader been moved from the introduction to the conclusion easily? And is the work clear? There's a further discussion around apparatus, what Morello was describing about the presentation of images and the data and whether or not they look pretty enough. But it's, there's a wider question that even pertains when, like my own work, there aren't any tables or graphs or numbers. I work with words rather than numbers. Um, but is the presentation professional? Are all of the references complete? Is the article strewn with typographical errors that the editor is going to need to correct? And all of that speaks to the, your professional approach to the journal and will be commented on by a reviewer. But finally, is the arg argument that's being presented of interest to the readers of this particular journal? Does this journal, does, do you address the audience that the, audi that the journal is trying to capture? So does it fit with the journal or more widely with the press that you're approaching? Next slide. How then do you write a peer review? Well, as a peer reviewer, First thing I try to remind myself is don't be reviewer number two, the notorious reviewer who gives the four star rating or damns the work from a height. What I really want to try and do though is ensure that I communicate my ideas about the article back and recognize the work that the author has done. Everybody has spent, anybody who's written an article or a book has spent an enormous amount of time working on the project, thinking about the puzzle that they're trying to solve. And a publication is ultimately the culmination of that kind of work. So it should be treated with respect and with a degree of humility by the reviewer to understand that the work that's being done is somebody else's hard work and graft and shouldn't just be dismissed out of hand. So I think it's responsible of a reviewer to tell the reader, the writer in the first sentence, the result of their decision making. So you open by saying this article is going to be 
revise and resubmit or will be rejected so that they're not, as they open the file, fretting too long to try and figure out what the decision is going to be. I think it's then useful to summarize what you understand the study is trying to achieve. In other words, you give the author your sense of what the argument was so that they have the right then to come back and say, actually, I think the reader misunderstood my purpose. That's a common enough uh, outcome. And that helps to the, create the dialogue that Morella was talking about between the reviewer and the author. So once you've summarized that argument, you can say then what you thought was good about the article and in relation to what it did achieve when it set out its aims and goals. Even if you're deciding to reject it, and perhaps particularly when you're trying to reject an article, it's important to say what the article did achieve and what was good about it, because the author will certainly feel bruised and uh, somewhat aggrieved at any rejection. That doesn't go away. You then need to justify your decision for making the recommendation that you did. And I think this is important because if nothing else, it helps the editor articulate back to the reader or to the writer what has gone wrong. So you can justify your decision by saying that you've rejected it for these reasons or you've accepted it for those reasons. Both, both are true and it helps an editor bring this material forward to justify their decision to publish to an editorial board. You also need to offer constructive criticism. Usually this is where the heavy lifting gets done in the middle of the review helping the author to move the article forward towards a publishable state. Things that you've identified that are wrong, you should be trying to think about constructive suggestions you can make to help fix the problem or to move to, to strengthen the argument that's on offer. Be detailed here and specific. If you're going to say that more work needs to be added in the literary uh, su summary, Identify articles that need to be included. Don't just say more work on World War II needs to be read. That's not terribly helpful. You need to think more specifically about specific examples of what needs to be looked at. And if you are rejecting the study, say why you're doing so, but always make it about the article and not about the author. Don't make it personal. It's the article that's being rejected and the author that's being, uh, but not the author. The author is not under review. It's the work in question. Many a uh, bad review starts in on the fact that the author has failed to do this, the author has failed to do that. That's not true, the article has failed to do it. So identify a path forward for the study. And even if you're rejecting a piece of work, say specifically what you think could be done constructively. This article could be improved in this way and then submitted to a different journal, for example. And always try and end on a positive note, rehearse the fact that you found things that were good about the work in question that helps to soften the blow a little, even if they are going to end up uh, feeling bruised and battered at the end of your rejection note. Okay, next question, next piece. And this I'll quickly skip through because in many ways, Morella covered some of this when thinking about what happened in relation to grant uh, reviews. But I do think it's important that you read a peer review carefully and cautiously. Don't have the knee jerk reaction and write a response immediately. You need to pause and think about it. And you need to set aside your anxieties and certainly don't spend your time trying to identify who wrote the review in question. That's a very uh, foolish habit that people develop. And it, uh, I know that it's, people have been misidentified as reviewers and grudges have long been held that have been based on reviews that people thought they wrote when they didn't. So try and avoid all of that and instead just simply accept the decision that's been taken. As Morella pointed out, it's important that you identify the central criticism or the central criticisms in the work and recognize any commonalities that exist across the reviews. That allows you then to identify the areas that your work needs to address in taking the article forward. And that allows you to take on the constructive criticism that may be buried deep in the weave of the review. That then allows you to decide ultimately whether you're going to revise and resubmit it to back to the journal you're going to revise the work and redirect it to another journal, or you're simply going to say that you've taken this as far forward as you can in its current state, and you reject the article, but you learn from the process of having undergone peer review. So you reject and you reflect. Next slide, please. I wanna really wrap up by thinking about how to spot a bad review. I think bad reviews, of which we have seen many examples over the years, do one of three things, one or more indeed of three things. First of all, it tells you what the reviewer knows about the subject. 
not about what you've done in terms of the engagement with the subject, but what they know about the area and the field. This is of little or no use to a reviewer, uh, to a uh, to an author, to discover that their author, the reviewer, doesn't really know the field terribly well, or is indeed a pronounced expert. That's kind of irrelevant to the subject. But you'll often find paragraphs which are filled with this kind of information. Secondly, you can be told by the reviewer how they would have written the piece had they had the chance. Well, they didn't write the piece. One of the best piece of advice I got about a review I got was uh, somebody who who told me. The thing to remember is that you wrote the book and they wrote the review. Your work stands apart from the work that they've done. And it's important that when you're reviewing a piece of work, you don't simply say, well, I would have done this differently and I would have put chapter six as chapter two and chapter four as chapter five, or I would have refashioned it in this way or that way. The work that's in front of you is the work that you should be reviewing. And quite often reviewers fail to address the work that's actually been presented and they try and reimagine a better version of the article. Finally, I think there's a tendency amongst reviewers to point up the work that they've done in this field and to suggest that the author should really engage with it. My favourite of these was an occasion in which a reviewer helpfully told an author that the article could not be published because they hadn't referenced their own books. So we found a situation where my, a friend of mine has a, a letter which says that his own work had failed to be referenced in an article and therefore the article was going to be rejected. Quite a sort of there's that sense of the failure, in a sense, to understand the process of reviewing itself. How then do you respond to a peer review? Well, I think, as Morella has pointed out, you need to accept the reviewer's decision and thank them for their work. Reviewing takes time and energy, and it uses up an awful lot of um, academics' uh, hard-pressed time. So I think it's important we do reflect on the fact that they are working hard to help journals and publications get out. You articulate what you see as the central criticisms, you recognize the commonalities and acknowledge the key areas for revision. You take up the constructive criticism and say what you will do to refine the submission. Finally, you state how you will respond to the remaining criticisms in order of their importance, and you can reject some of them out of hand and say that they don't need to be addressed for these reasons. And finally, I think you need to set a deadline for any revisions that you're going to do and accept or accept the deadline that's been offered to you by an editor. But all of that process is here to help improve your work, both at the grant stage and at the publication stage. So a constructive engagement with process of peer review actually will help your article be a better piece of work. That's all I would like to add. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much, Michael. I'll just say that I've just uh, popped up some further reading on that slide there, and uh, I won't go through it now because we, we have five minutes left for questions, but just to let you know as well that there is a, an open research um, email address there if you need to get in contact with the open research team or if you have any further questions afterwards. So I'll stop sharing the slide now and we're back. I'll just see if there are questions coming through in chat. So don't feel shy about uh, asking questions now. People are quite happy to um, answer anything that you have, any questions that you might have about this. And you'll, the slides will be available afterwards, so you, you'll be able to work down through the slides. It's been very interesting, actually, to uh, to look at the two things side by side, STEM and arts humanities, because it, it is quite different. I mean, I came from a, a STEM background originally and then switched to the arts humanities, so I've sort of got a, you know, I'm, I'm in both pies, fingers and both eyes, but uh, you know, it's it's just it's interesting that the 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 whole research world is in terms of grants is so different to what we'd exper experience in the arts. Yeah, well, well, whilst people are thinking about questions, I um, I had a um, recent experience as a panel member, but as a panel member, you're also a reviewer for grants, uh, and that's something you do have to to remember. Where um, an applicant responded to me all in capital letters—that's never a good idea. <laughs> so, this is where we talk about 